Uh, my name is Fernando Gont. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina, in South America. Uh, and I'm really glad to be part of this event. Uh, and also glad to have my first chance to visit your country, uh, learn a bit about your history, try some food, and also test myself against the crazy traffic here in, in Mumbai that so far I'm, I'm surviving. I thought the traffic in my city was crazy, and I learned that I was wrong, so. Um, so, uh, this is a presentation about five security myths uh, CEISO should be aware of. And the short title of this presentation essentially is, well, if you are a CISO, what are the things that you should know about B6, particularly when it comes to, to myths? As a kind of introduction, I don't know how many of you, how many of you have heard about IPv6 one way or another? Okay, so that's, that's good. Uh, if you have heard about IPv6, you probably know that the reason for which we have that protocol, or we hope to have that protocol, is because we are running out of IPv4 addresses, okay? So essentially with B4, we have uh, 32 bits of addresses, and that's not enough. So far, we have been dealing with that by adding this uh, fancy device, usually called NAT, which essentially allows us to share some address among several systems. But of course, that solution doesn't scale. Um, if we continued in that path, we would be adding several layers of, of NATs and the network would become like horrible. So um, what about IPv6? Usually when you talk to people about IPv6, they think that, well, it's something that in, at some point in time in the future it will come, but it's something like very far. But if you think about it, uh, one way or another, that protocol is already here. For example, if you look at any of the popular operating systems, um, all of them have IPv6 support enabled by default. Um, also, since last, sorry, two years ago, uh, there was the World IPv6 launch day, which essentially means that large content providers such as Google, Facebook, Yahoo, and others enable IPv6 in their production servers. So that means that, for example, if you have uh, IPv6 access, uh, that means that you might be visiting those websites using IPv6 rather than IPv4. And finally, there have been cases, also not that many, of ISPs that are providing IPv6 access to their customers. There are examples such as T-Mobile or Comcast in the USA, but there are others. And the reason is not because they like IPv6, but rather because, again, they are running out of IPv6 addresses, and without the addresses, they cannot continue making money if you want. One of the biggest problems about IPv6 is that, uh, to put it in a very educated way, uh, you hear lots of things about it that are wrong, which I'm referring to uh, them as myth, okay? Things that everyone assumes that they are truth, but if you really pay a little bit of time to actually analyze them, you realize that there's not so much uh, truth to those things. And of course, that causes problems because if you start, for example, thinking about something, whatever that is, with uh, wrong assumptions, that might lead you to wrong decisions. So essentially, this presentation is about trying to dismantle some of those myths. There are myths in every single area of IPv6, from functionality to security and so on. But in this presentation, I will just focus on security. So let's start with the first myth. So one of the things that you may have heard is that IPv6 is more secure than IPv4. Um, if you want to find a reason for which this myth came up, it's because when the protocol was first developed in the 90s, it was assumed that um, IPv6 would lead to an increased use of IPsec in the network, and that IPv4 uh, implementations wouldn't implement IPsec. So the idea would be that if we were to deploy IP, I, IPv6, that would lead to increased use of IPsec, but with IPv4, nobody would even bother to implement IPsec. However, that, uh, that claim is actually a myth, and of course, it's, it's not true. So let's just consider a few aspects, and even not that technical about V6. First of all, is that uh, when you compare V6 with V4, it's a more complex protocol. Even when the functionality that these protocols provide, they are just internet layer protocols, uh, for doing exactly the same thing, IPv6 is actually quite a bit more, more complex. More protocols involved, and usually uh, what you find out is that people that start learning about this protocol, uh, it, uh, they, they find it hard to you know, 
to get the, the, let's say, the overall picture. They learn about different protocols, but it's hard to figure out how they all fit together. Of course, having a complex protocol leads to potential problems, potential implementation problems, and, and so on. Another aspect has to do with the maturity of the v6 code. We have been running before for many, many, many years. But uh, when it comes to IPv6 code, some code dates back to the late 90s, but other, there are other implementations that might be more recent, like five years, maybe 10 years at most. And that means that regardless of the, uh, the, um, the characteristics of the protocol itself, the code that actually implements those protocols is, is different in, in terms of, of maturity. So you should be expecting uh, quite a few bugs to be found in V6 implementations, not because the protocol is bad by itself, but just because the, 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 the V6 code had not be, been tested uh, as much as the V4 code. Other aspects are uh, less support in security devices. So let's say that you just compare two firewalls and you look at what that firewall can do with V4 and what that firewall can do with V6. Typically, uh, that firewall probably can do much more with IPv4. In many cases, they don't even support IPv6. And in those few cases in which the, uh, there is some kind of uh, feature, a parity of, of features, uh, you find things such as uh, that there are differences, for example, in terms of, of performance. There are devices that implement the IPv4 functionality in hardware, but when it comes to v6, they implement the same functionality in software, which at the end of the day uh, has an impact, of, uh, to the, uh, an impact on, on the extent to which you can use those devices for doing stuff in your network. There's also a lack of well-trained human resources, which means that uh, even if the above were not a problem and you want to deploy V6 on your network or take care of V6, you don't have that people to do it, uh, which depending on your point of view, it might be good or bad. For me, it's perfect, but for you, it might not be that perfect. Uh, which essentially means that this, all these things add up uh, and make a situation that is not as nice as you'd expect. All of these aspects, uh, the maturity of, of the code, whether you have enough people to deal with this or not, will of course have an impact on the overall security that the uh, emerging IPv6 networks will have. Uh, so what I'd like to conclude for this first myth is that it's not only that the protocol, that one protocol is not better than the other, but also that there are other aspects that should be considered which at the end of the day, you know, will have an implication on, on the uh, security level of, of such networks. The second myth is that uh, many people argue that um, right now we have a security paradigm that is network-centric and that with IPv6 is host-centric. Um, essentially what these people say is that as, uh, uh, as a result of V6 deployment, all of those mitigations that you currently have on, on a network, for example, like a border network uh, at your enterprise, will actually move to the end systems. And I think that this claim is like uh, essentially wrong from, from starters, because if you think about the model that you have on, on the internet, usually you have a, an, an, an hybrid model. So you have things that are deployed in the network, like a network-based firewall, but you also have things that are deployed on the nodes, antiviruses on the local nodes and other stuff that you have on the network. So that's not even true from, from starters. And if you think about V6, I personally didn't find any actual evidence that V6 will change that model that we currently have. Third myth um, is about IPv6 address scans. So if, for example, you think about the way in which many uh, attacks are performed nowadays, that usually starts with what is usually referred to as network reconnaissance, which means that there is an attacker that tries to find, for example, systems that are alive on some network, and once he finds those systems, of course, he can try to launch some attacks against them. One of the most, let's say, uh, popular and trivial ways to, uh, to find those systems is to perform address scans. So if you know that, for example, some network, or if an attacker knows that some network has this prefix assigned, so he simply sweeps the whole address space to find all of the systems that are connected to that network. Um, the reason for which that's feasible is that in the case of IPv4, uh, the, the, actual, the, the address space is like small enough. In the previous presentation, uh, it was shown that they scan the whole internet to find stuff. Well, it would be like impossible to do the same thing uh, on the IPv6 internet. So the myth is that with V6, uh, the address scans are impossible. And that myth 
is usually based on two assumptions. Uh, the first one is that the IPv6 subnet size is huge, which is actually true. It's typically 64 bits. So you have in each network 64 bits to assign node addresses. Uh, but there is a second assumption that uh, is about addresses being randomly assigned. So, okay, you have 64 bits for assigning the node addresses, but how are those, uh, those addresses selected? Well, many people assume that those addresses are randomly selected. So uh, that would make essentially an a brute force address scan impossible. But if you actually look at uh, those addresses, how nodes select their addresses, you find that uh, most of the addresses follow specific patterns. We actually did like a very detailed study on this topic. I'm just giving you like a trivial example. Uh, for example, in this case, I have two IPv6 addresses, and you can see that the two addresses have been sequentially uh, assigned. So that means that if your network assigns addresses in this way, like the first node has a one, the second a two, and so on, of course it would be trivial to find those nodes. Um, this means that the IPv6 service scanning attacks are feasible if an attacker is smart enough to actually exploit or leverage these address patterns. And another way to uh, think about this is that in the case of IPv4, we have, let's say, some, the, the techniques that we use for address scanning are rudimentary because there is no much point in actually trying to over-engineer that of scanning networks because the address space is so small, but with V6, uh, that is necessary. Myth number four, some people assume that uh, IPv6 will be not free, and um, the, 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 usually that's based on the assumption that since there are plenty of addresses, there's no uh, need for address translation. But if you think about NATs, they provide some interesting features, such as address sharing, uh, network topology hiding, host migrating, and, and so on. And that means that while many people hate this fact, there are many folks out there that actually like many of these properties. And they actually want to keep this kind of device, NATs, in the IPv6 world. Actually, there are quite a few uh, devices that already implement IPv6 uh, NAT. And, uh, from my perspective, I think that that's obvious. Uh, there will be at least some level of, of deployment of these devices on the V6 internet. I, I'm making this particular comment on one hand because there are some people that think that you know the V6 network will be all, all shiny, which will not. But I have also heard some folks say, no, we, we will not deploy IPv6 because we don't have NAT functionality, which is not true either. So that could be good or bad depending on your point of view. Five and last myth is that uh, IPv6 will remove the complexity of the network. And usually one of the devices that, uh, let's say, increases complexity in the network are NAT devices because they are stateful, they, they do in stateful inspection, they have to, you know, overwrite packets and, and so on. However, since V6 and V4 are not, uh, let's say, V6 is not power compatible with V4, in order to deploy this protocol, you have to use lots of transition and coexistence technologies such as tunnels and blah, blah, blah. Uh, this essentially means that the complexity of the network will actually increase, no matter whether you like it or not, and you will have to deal with such complexity, whether, whether inside your network or maybe outside of your network, because maybe you are being attacked by some node and you want to track that node, but that node is coming from the V6 internet or whatever. Five myth is that, and that's one that you always hear, is that, okay, this might be complex, there might be issues here, but my network doesn't support IPv6, so why should I care about this? So this is actually a myth, but the answer will be tomorrow at uh, quarter to 11. So if you, have it, you think you have a before only network and you think this doesn't affect you, tomorrow we can discuss this. So I'd like to thank the organizers for taking a lot of effort bringing me here. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email or contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice.